I believe God's given me a, a word for your life. So let me pray one more time before I jump into today's message. Lord, I just want to thank you again. Lord, when, uh, when, when the team sang, so will I, God, uh, something shifted in me. And I thank you, Lord. Uh, the part that says, if the rocks will cry out in silence, so will I. And I pray that we would learn not to be moved by the silence of those around us, but to cry out and worship you, Lord, at all times. I believe with all of my heart that you've given me a prophetic word for this house. I, I believe with all my heart, Lord God, that people need to hear the word that you've placed in me. And it's not me, Lord, it's you. So, Lord, I put myself to the side and I pray that the favor of God would rest upon me and that the anointing that breaks every yoke be upon every person in this room today. Lord, all over this room, there are people that are at various levels in their spirituality. There are some here this morning that are seeking, that are looking, some that are invited here for the first time. Uh, Lord, there are others that have been saved all their lives. There are others, Lord, that are just in and out and they're battling. The great thing about you is you meet us all at the same level. And uh, so, Lord, I yield to you. I surrender to you. I thank you for every person here. You have a word for them. And I bless you in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Hey, look at the, somebody next to you and tell them, if you come to the third service, you will lose five pounds that Sunday. <laughs> tell them. Oh, and you can't eat that week either. That's how you'll lose the weight, amen? We're gonna have a thousand people in that service now, amen? <laughs> Let me put my timer on. Hey, this morning, I wanna take a look at, at a couple of scriptures that, that I believe will encourage you as they've encouraged me. I, I wanna do a, a, some teaching and then I'll jump into some screaming and some preaching, um, some hooping and hollering because I'm really excited about today's message. Now, the two scriptures that I'm gonna share with you um, they both begin with the word and. Now, I want you to pay attention, those of you who love grammar, those of us who pay attention to grammar and we're always correcting people. Um, and is a conjunction. How many of you remember conjunction? What is your? Okay, the rest of you were high when that was going on, all right? <laughs> A conjunction is a word that connects a phrase or words together or even thoughts together. So the word and, we know this, is a word that connects two thoughts. It connects a sentence or a paragraph. They are, and so the two scriptures that I'm going to share with you start with the word and because they are part of a larger teaching on Christian living that, that the Apostle Paul teaches that, uh, that shows how important the Holy Spirit is for our everyday lives. I'm going to continue this morning teaching on the Holy Spirit. I, and I'm, so what I'm going to do before I sh share them with you is I'm going to take them out of their text. They're found in, both found in Ephesians, but I'm going to take them out of their text and I'm going to join them together with a conjunction and it's going to show you their function. Ah, all right. Because these two scriptures, in reality, give us true empowerment to live in this life. Um, so the first one is Ephesians 4.30, and, and it says this. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let me read that again. And do not, somebody say and. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, here's the next one, Ephesians 5, 18. And don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me read it again. Some of you right away, as soon as we talk about wine, you start freaking out, all right? And don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead... This is where we'll focus today. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there's, there's two commands there. And so if you'll allow me to, I'm going to take the liberty and I'm going to join those scriptures together and watch what the scripture says. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. 
Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit and, there's the conjunction, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, which whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. One more time, I'm going to read the whole thing again. Do not or don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled. Somebody say filled. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So here is what I believe the Holy Spirit wants to teach to each of us this morning. We're given a positive instruction and then we're given a warning here. A positive instruction and then a warning. The positive one is be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled. And then the warning is this. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit. The word grieve in the Greek means to sadden. It means to bring sorrow or heaviness upon something or to make sorry. So we're taught to be filled with the Holy Spirit and then make sure you don't grieve him. So why does the Apostle Paul want to teach us this this morning? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to answer that for you. We must understand that the greatest gift after salvation that God has given to us is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again because this is a Pentecostal church. And in Pentecostal churches, the people participate with the preacher. You may come from another church and God bless that church, but you're not there anymore. You're at this church. And not only is this church Pentecostal, but I'm Latino, which means I want people to talk back. So when I say a good thing, even if you don't like it, fake it and say amen. All right? So you need to understand that the most precious gift after your salvation that you have is the Holy Spirit. He is the most precious thing that you have in your life. And because of that, you have to protect that asset. You have to be careful and take care of him. Because Paul teaches us here that he can be grieved, he can be saddened, he can be quenched. And when we allow that to happen to the Holy Spirit inside of us, we get messed up. As Christians, if we are not daily filled with the Holy Spirit, we're in trouble. So the command here when he says be filled with the Holy Spirit isn't a one-time thing. In fact, the Greek tense means be being filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's something that needs to happen every day that you're awake. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you. Can I get an amen? It needs to happen every day. Now watch this. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, um, he becomes saddened, which when he is saddened, he becomes quiet. Let me remind you that the Holy Spirit is our counselor. He is our guide. He is the one who convicts, convicts us of sin. The Bible says in the book of Romans that he searches the mind of Christ and he reveals the counsel of God to us. He is the one who empowers us. So if this Holy Spirit is sad inside of us, everything that he provides for us daily becomes weak. You with me so far? So I want to show you what happens when we aren't filled with the Holy Spirit, when we, aren't, when we grieve him. And, and the best illustration that I can share with you is found once again in the story of Adam and Eve. A couple weeks ago, I preached about Adam and, and the Holy Spirit has not allowed me to leave that. I've just been stuck in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 uh, the last three or four weeks. And, and so I want to revisit who Adam is because in Adam, we see us. In Adam's mistake, we see our mistake. So I want to remind you this morning that when God breathed into Adam, not only was Adam animated, not only did he become alive, but he also received the full measure of the Holy Spirit. He was completely full of the Spirit of God. With the breath of the Holy Spirit then came a complete and intimate understanding of who he was. Adam got his identity from the Holy Spirit. 
Adam never doubted his nature. When God told Adam to name all the animals, Adam didn't say, I don't know if I can do that. When God told him to do it, he said, I got this. I got it. Why? Because he gained his identity by by his relationship with the Father through the Holy Spirit. Adam didn't have to doubt his sexuality. Adam didn't have to doubt his abilities or his intelligence. Adam had zero insecurity telling him that he wasn't enough to do all that God had asked him to do. When God told him to do something, he could do it. Why? Because he heard God tell him, you got this. Adam, check this out. Adam was a scientist who specialized in horticulture. He was a scientist who specialized in agriculture, in zoology, and in botany. He was bad. He had communion every day with with Father God. He had fellowship with God. He had dominion over all of creation. He lived, check this out, Adam lived in the revealed will of God. There was no guessing for Adam as to what God's will was. He didn't have to guess it. Do I do this or don't I? He just knew. Not because Adam was a God. Remember that. Adam was not a God. He was not a mini God. Adam was a human just like you and I. But he lived in a time and in an age of innocence. Adam was holy and set apart from the rest of creation. Adam had zero prejudice in his life. Adam had zero lust in his life. There was no no pain in his body or in his thinking. He had no mental struggles. There, were, well, there was no sickness. Adam had never experienced failure. Adam never knew what sadness was. There was no shame in his life. There was no guilt. There was no shame in his game. Ah, he didn't have anything to be ashamed about. Adam had zero fear. Now, check this out. Adam was sinless, but capable of sin. Did you get that? Adam was sinless but capable of sin. He hadn't sinned, but it was in him to be able to sin. I want to remind you that God did not create robots to do everything like, yes, sir. Is this a robot? (laughs) That was dumb. (laughs) Worship team, get up here. Church is over. (laughs) He had free will. He could choose to say yes or no to God. He was sinless, but capable of sin. Now check this out. No one had to tell Adam who he was. No one had to speak into his life because God himself was doing all the speaking. Okay? Adam's spirit was joined to the Holy Spirit, and he was built up from the inside out. Adam didn't need a text message to tell him, hey man, keep your head up. Adam didn't need somebody calling him and say, man, I haven't seen you in church in a while. Adam didn't need somebody to tell him, hey, man, you're better than that. Adam knew it. It wasn't pride. It wasn't arrogance. It was just all of that identity came from his relationship with God. I'm going somewhere with this, I promise you. But this was all about to drastically change because the day came when Adam let his guard down. Remember last week, PK gets your gloves up or you guys already forgot that. Okay. Adam, instead of keeping his gloves up, put his gloves down. And so in Genesis chapter three, we are introduced for the very first time to an animal called the serpent. Now the serpent back then did not crawl on his belly the way snakes do today. Serpents were upright and they had legs and they walked. And it says, the Bible says that the serpent was more crafty than any other animal that had been created. He was astute. And the enemy came and possessed the serpent and came to Eve, his wife, and began to entice and tempt Eve because the only instruction that God had given to Adam is, hey man, this garden is yours. I want you to tend it. I want you to have a great time. I want you to enjoy everything here. But there is a tree here of the knowledge of good and evil that I don't want you to eat from. Eat everywhere else except from this tree. And so one day Adam let his guard down and his wife saw the tree and the serpent came and tempted her. Let me, let me ask you this question. 
Have you ever wondered why Eve did not freak out when the serpent talked to her? No? Would you freak out if an animal started talking to you? You'd be like, what the heck? She didn't freak out when the animal started talking to her. Some theologians believe that the serpent could talk. She wasn't shocked. She wasn't surprised. And he he fools her into eating. And we know the story that she then came to Adam and he ate. Now, the instruction that God had told Adam was this. If you eat of this tree, you will die spiritually. You will lose everything that I've given to you. You will lose my Holy Spirit. You will lose all the authority. You will lose all the dominion. You will begin to question who you are. You will question everything about you if you eat this. You see, Adam had enjoyed intimacy with the Father. He had that great relationship with God. Now check this out. I want you to understand the word that I'm about to use. But the day came when he neglected that relationship. Neglect. Write that word down if you're taking notes. Neglect. He neglected his spirituality. He neglected to meet with the Father. And remember, I told you he was sinless, but he was capable of sinning. And in that moment, without him even recognizing it, the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy, and he deceived Adam. He tempted Eve with the fruit of the tree, and she ate. Now, some people think it was an apple. How many of you ever heard that it was an apple? We don't know if it was an apple. It just says a fruit. Now, if it's going to be me, it's a watermelon. Because if I'm going to sin, I'm going to sin enjoying sin. Oh, you religious nuts here. Come on. If you're going to sin, you might as well enjoy that sin. Three of you are being honest. The rest of you are like, I don't enjoy my sin, you liar. So he gave Adam a watermelon through his wife Eve, a seedless one, grown in Hermiston. It was local. It was local. It was red, watered when he looked at it. And Eve gave it to him. And he partook of it. And when Adam ate the fruit, in that very moment, he lost everything that God gave to him. He lost the Holy Spirit. And he lost everything that the Holy Spirit provided. He lost it all. He could no longer have that closeness with God. He lost everything when he decided to disobey God. God said, you can have everything you want except this. How many of you know that when you tell your kids you can do everything but you can't do this, how many of you know that that's the exact thing that they want? Come on, somebody. And how many of you remember that when you were a kid and you messed up, the moment you heard your dad walk in the door, what did you do? You went to hide. I'm going to tell you where we get that from. I still do that to my dad today sometimes. In in chapter 3, verse 8, I'm going to read it to you. I promise I'm going somewhere and we're almost done. In chapter 3, verse 8, okay, now Adam has sinned. He, He now has an awareness that he is naked. The Bible says in chapter 2 that they were naked and unashamed. And if you've been in any of my marital counseling, as I've counseled many of you in marriage, one of the first things that I talk about is being naked and unashamed in marriage. That goes beyond a physical nakedness. It's an emotional nakedness. It's being open and unashamed about that openness. And that was Adam and Eve. They were naked and they were unashamed. They had nothing to hide from each other. There was no such thing as hiding because he was just open to God. He was open to his wife. There was nothing in his life that he had to hide. But the The moment that he sinned, the Bible says that one day God came looking for him. God comes walking. Now watch what happens. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now before, when they would hear God walking, they would come to God. 
Now, when they hear God walking, they want to hide. What's the difference if it's not Holy Spirit? Adam knew he had screwed up. And he hears God walking, and instead of coming to God, he runs from God. Let's keep reading. It says here, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden before the presence of God would build him up. It would encourage him. Now he's running from the thing that would build him up and encourage him. He's hiding from it. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said, he, he asks a rhetorical question. Adam, where are you? And before I continue reading, I believe that God's asking many of us here that same question. Where are you? And I'm not talking about Sendero Life Center on a Sunday morning when it's raining outside. I believe God's asking you this question right now. Where are you in your walk with him? Where are you at? All right, let's keep going before I start screaming, all right? So he said, watch this. I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. For the very first time, Adam felt the spirit of fear. In that moment, the spirit of fear comes into humanity. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And God said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the fruit of the tree that I told you not to eat from? He heard God walking and instead of running to him, he hides. And there we find for the very first time shame and guilt. At one time, he loved walking with God. Now he's hiding from God. And when God says, where are you? He's hiding. And he comes out from his hiding. And he says, I was afraid of you because I was naked. And God said, man, who told you that, boy? Who told you that, that you were naked? Who told, I, that didn't come from me. I, 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 I wonder, how, how many of you have had kids growing up that you teach them a certain way, then they start hanging out with their friends at school and going to their friend's house, and they come back home with bad habits and bad words? Or some of you maybe were those neighbors. <laughs> and your kid comes back and starts saying stuff that you don't allow in your life, don't allow in your home, and you tell them, where did you get that from? You didn't get it from us. And God says, where did you get that from? Because you didn't get it from me. When you were enjoying covenant relationship with me, Adam, the only influence and the only voice in your life was mine. I didn't tell you who was, you were naked. Who told you that, baby boy? Who told you you had to hide? You didn't get that from me. I didn't speak that into your life. I didn't speak shame and guilt into your life. Who told you that? Who has become the key influence in your life? All you've heard from me, baby boy, is that you're my son and that I love you and I've given you authority and I've given you dominion. I've told you to be fruitful and multiply. I've given you authority and that you can do everything that you want that's in your heart. Who told you you were naked? Who told you you weren't enough? Who told you to be ashamed? Who told you to hide, baby boy? You didn't get that from me. Who told you that? Fear entered his life. Insecurity came into Adam's life. Sadness came into his life. And these feelings of fear and insecurity and guilt and shame began to influence his thinking and his reasoning. And he forgot everything that Abba Father had taught to him. And he paid more attention to the feeling of guilt, to the feeling of fear, than he did to the truth of God's voice. Who told you you were naked? Now I'm getting tipped. Who told you that, Adam? Who told you to hide? Who taught you how to hide from my presence? Son, you used to come to me at all times, and now you're hiding from me. Who told you you were weak? And God asked him the question that he already knew the answer to. Did you eat what I told you not to? Because the only reason why you'd be acting this way, Adam, is if you sinned and you lost my Holy Spirit. 
And when he lost the influence of the Holy Spirit family, he lost it all. God kicked him out of the garden and he could no longer walk with God and he no longer had the fullness of God's spirit. And from that moment on, listen to me very, very quick. You don't have to teach your kids selfishness. It's just inerrant. You, and I said this a few weeks ago, you don't have to teach your kids to say mine when they don't want to share toys. You don't have to teach them that. It's in them. Why? Because somebody told Adam he was naked. He disobeyed. He disobeyed. And from that moment on, according to the book of Romans, the sin nature was passed on to every human that is born. We're not born, and I shared this three weeks ago. We're born body, soul, and spirit. But when you're born, that spirit is dead. It's dead. Just like Adam. Adam, when he was created, he had a body, he had a soul, and his spirit was alive because the spirit of God came and breathed life into him. And he had the Holy Spirit. But when he sinned and disobeyed God, that Holy Spirit left him and his spirit became dead. Dead. That's why the Apostle Paul says you were dead in your transgressions and in your sin. You were dead. Adam died. He didn't die physically, but he died spiritually. And dying spiritually is worse than dying physically. I wonder if anybody is receiving something this morning. Uh, the sadness and insecurity that you feel today mm -hmm, came from Adam. The feeling that you don't measure up and that you'll never be able to overcome came from Adam. That mental struggle that you have and you need pills to calm the thoughts came from Adam because he disobeyed and he lost the Holy Spirit. And we were doomed to struggle like that for eternity, family. That was our lot, eternity. You know, there's a reason why God kicked Adam out of the garden because there was another tree in that garden. It was the tree of eternal life. And God said, God said, if if he eats from the tree of eternal life, he'll become like us. He will be eternal and he will eternally be dead spiritually. So I got to kick him out because that boy will try to eat from that tree too. Because I will kick him out because I got a plan. I got a plan that was, that was hatched before the foundation of the world. My son Jesus will be the second Adam and he will do what the first Adam could not do and he will erase the penalty of sin and he will give new life to everybody else that's born after Adam. And that man is Jesus Christ. And Jesus did everything and has given us everything that Adam has lost. Somebody's got to get excited about that. Everything that Adam lost, the precious Holy Spirit, the conviction, the voice of God, everything that he lost, Jesus said, here it is right back. Here's the keys to authority. It's yours. You have delegated authority now. Whew. And when you give your heart to Jesus, family, listen to me very closely. I'm almost done. When you give your heart to Jesus, the same breath that gave life to Adam is now breathed into you. This is the same breath. It's not different. It is the same breath. So will I. The song that talks about creation, that so will I breath comes into you today. That's the reason to get excited. I know I might sound nutty right now. I don't give a rip what you feel about me. But if you understood eternity, if you understood the mess and the angry man that I am without the Holy Spirit, you'd be jumping and hooping and hollering with me this morning as well. Because I was lost, but now I'm found. I was a wreck, but now God has put me together. Why? Because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. Ha. Ah. Ah, he's, he, the Bible calls him the second Adam. He gave us everything that Adam lost. And we can have that holy nature now. We can have that Peter says that you and I are participators or partakers of the divine nature of Jesus Christ. Family, do you even get that this morning? Do you get that the apostle Peter, the one that walked with Jesus, the one that, that drowned after walking on the waters, he says that because of Jesus, you and I participate in his divine nature. Oh my God, excuse me if that offends you, but oh my God, I can, I can participate, you can participate in the divine nature of Jesus. It doesn't mean we're gods because we're not gods, we're sinners saved by grace, amen. But everything that Jesus did 
we are enabled to do. Don't come at me that you can't. Don't come at me that life is too hard. Do you know who you are? Don't come at me that it's just too difficult. Be quiet with that nonsense. Find out what God says about it. And so, so, I, so back to the scriptures before I'm done this morning. Layla, in a few minutes, you can, you can come on up. Listen, listen to me, okay? Because of Jesus, now we have that empowerment. But, but every day, if you've given your heart to Jesus, you have to ask the Holy Spirit, fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me. Because when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are empowered to live for, for God. You are empowered to live worthy of your calling. You are, you are given power over temptation. You receive the wisdom, the counsel of heaven, and you can live and walk in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Ah, but the problem, so much, not so much for us anymore, is the filling. In, in, the, in this Pentecostal church, we talk a lot about the Holy Spirit, and, and he fills us. The, the problem isn't the positive command. It's the warning. It's the warning. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve. How do you and I grieve? How do we make the Holy Spirit sad? Well, what did Adam do? He disobeyed, which was Sin. I mean, that's how we grieve him. I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. We grieve the Holy Spirit by our disobedience, the language that we use, how we speak of others and of ourselves. I, 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 let me remind you, there's, there's three gates in your life that, that, can, that can open the door to, to grieving the Holy Spirit. The, the, the first one is the eye gate. A lot of times what you see influences you. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful what you allow yourself to see. And, and I'm ju not just talking about movies. I'm just talking about life in general. What you allow yourself to see often influences your, your mind. And it's not, not, not just what you allow yourself. It's not just the gate of, of the eyes. It's the gate of the hearing, the ear gate. What you allow yourself to digest by your hearing. When you hear the doctor say you're going to die. When you hear your spouse say, I'm going to divorce you. When you hear your kids say, I hate you. When you hear your boss say, you're nothing. When, when you hear the news say, life is horrible. All these things that you allow yourself to hear begin to speak to your soul. And it's not just, it's not just the eye gate and the ear gate, but the eye gate and the ear gate then open the mouth gate. And what you say is who you are. Many, many people don't need anybody to tell them they're idiots. They call themselves an idiot. Many people don't need anybody to tell them they can't amount, they're not going to amount to anything because they tell themselves that. And those gates open the door to destruction in our lives. Those gates open the door to allow us to grieve the Holy Spirit who's inside of us. And when we grieve the Holy Spirit, listen to me, I'm almost done. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, he becomes quiet and the conviction in us isn't as strong Listen, we don't lose the Holy Spirit when we sin the way Adam did. We live in a different time. The Bible says that the gift and the call of God are irrevocable. So he doesn't leave you when you sin. But what he does is he, he quiets down. He becomes quenched. And all of a sudden, you start doing things that before you didn't do. Come on, somebody. You get saved and you start staying away from people and, and staying away from things and you no longer go out, you no longer sleep around, you no longer do the things that you do, but then you start to neglect that relationship with God. Then you start allowing some of those things back into your life. I can do that, I'm so sure. Only God can judge me. I feel bad for you because he's a righteous judge. And all of a sudden you neglect that relationship and you start allowing things back into your life that at one time you, you, can I, you ran the hell away from. Yeah, I said it. Because it ticks me off when I see Christians who begin to allow the Holy Spirit to be grieved and they justify their behavior. And before you used to run away from those things, before you were the first at this altar, before you were the first one to serve, before you were the first one in church, and now you've been saved for 5, 10, 15 years, and now some of those things aren't as important to you. You've quenched the Holy Spirit because if you were to listen to the Holy Spirit, you'd say, baby girl, baby boy, get up. 
get up, let me back in. And we grieve the Holy Spirit of God. And all of a sudden that voice becomes not as strong. I know I'm speaking truth to you today. Huh. And when we pay attention to the voice of the world and the voice of the enemy, we come under their influence. And we begin to listen to the, to the whisper of the enemy and the whisper of our friends who don't know Jesus. And then we begin to believe the lies about ourselves. And then one day God comes walking and asks you, asks you on a Sunday morning, where are you? Where are you? Being in church on a Sunday morning doesn't impress God. He's asking you this morning, where are you? Sendero's the in church in Moses Lake right now. They got great worship. It doesn't take a lot to show up. Where are you? And if you listen this morning to his voice, he'll ask you the next question. Who told you you were naked? It wasn't me. Who told you to be ashamed to live in guilt? Who told you that? I, God's saying to you this morning, I didn't tell you that. Where'd you get that from? Who told you that you're not enough? I didn't tell you that. Who told you that? Come on, tell me. God's standing up here, toeing the line, saying, who told you that? Who told you you couldn't overcome that sin? Who told you you couldn't overcome that mentality? Who told you that your marriage is over? My spouse did. I didn't say that, though. Who told you that? Who told you that your kids will always be addicts and that they'll never be free? Who told you that you will always be an addict and you will never be free? Who told you you will always be poor and living in poverty? Who told you that? Who told you that you can't get that education? Who told you you were stupid? Who told you you were depressed? Who told you that you'll never be healed of that sickness? I did not tell you that. Who told you? Who told you that? I didn't tell you that. Who told you that lie? Who told you that? God's coming to you the way he came to Adam and Eve. Who told you, baby boy? Who told you, baby girl? Who told you that you were down and out and you would never recover from that? Who told you that divorce, there's no coming back from that? Who told you that? Who told you you were gay? Who told you you were lesbian? Who told you that lie? I'm coming right at you, family. Rip me if you rip me, but I'm coming at you. Who told you that? Who told you you could kill yourself? Who told you you could commit suicide? Who told you that? Who told you to always stay depressed? Who told you to stay home? It's not me. Who told you that? Who told you that? Because when the Holy Spirit is quenched inside of me, I begin to listen to my feelings of depression. I begin to look in the mirror and not be happy with what I see, and I get down and discouraged. When I don't spend time with God and I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit and I quench him with my thoughts, I quench him with the things that I, that I allow into my life, then I start to wonder, Lord, can I pastor a church of 600 people now? Can I do that? I don't know if I can do that. God, that's too much. I'm not equipped. I'm not prepared. Mary and I can't do that. It's too much for us. Ha, Excuse me, excuse me, but I feel the Holy Spirit this morning speaking so strong. Who told you that? Who told you? that your marriage will never be the same. Who told you that? See, we get into trouble when we make decisions based on emotions. We make decisions based on, on how we feel in the moment that that voice is a lie, family. You gotta understand that. You gotta get your identity from the Holy Spirit that if you'll speak, if you'll allow him to speak to you, he'll tell you who you are. And you don't need anybody else to agree. You just need the voice of God. Am I speaking to anybody? So, so let me finish. I got to finish. Worship team, you guys, you guys come on up. Come on. Come on up real quick. Oh, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Family, it's time to get filled. Maybe you're here this morning and you're new and this is kind of like, whoa, why is that chubby guy screaming at me? This chubby guy loves you. That's why. This chubby guy benches 315. I'm joking. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we need the Holy Spirit, family. Ah, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to make space in our lives for the Spirit of God to move. 
Uh, the same way that he hovered over the face of the waters in Genesis chapter 1, he's hovering over this church right now. He's hovering over your life, and he's just waiting for the word of God to come and create peace out of chaos. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. So how do, how do you get filled? Let me, let me just give you a couple things. How do you get filled? Man, just ask him to fill you. Why, why, do we make, why do we make spirituality so much harder than what it is? I'm, I'm not saying it's not difficult. It's, for, it's difficult for some, but it's not as hard as you make it. It's just saying, God, would you fill me today with your presence? Just fill me. I, I, I just, because listen, this world can suck life out of you. Come on, somebody. Are there any real people here this morning? This world can suck the life out of you. And you become empty. And that emptiness demands filling. And you either get filled with the Spirit of God or you get filled with something else. And some of you are full of something else. Yeah, you, you fill in the word. And you need to get filled with the Holy Ghost this morning. And you ask him, Lord, just fill me. Fill me. And you spend time with him. And I'm not saying hours, because that's, that's almost impossible for most people. Just a few minutes saying, Holy Spirit, would you, would you tell me what to do? You, you, gotta, you gotta learn, you gotta learn. Uh, yeah, come here, we know. Let, get that microphone. So, so I'm gonna let you share your story just a second. Um, Maybe, yeah. If you stand down there, I'm just as tall as you. No, I'm joking. Come on. Come on. We know God has blessed him with a great uh, business, a real estate. And tell us what happened on Friday and how the Holy Spirit helped you. Just in a couple minutes, okay? We don't have all day. Yeah, so uh, Amy and I, it's my wife, Amy. Yes. Uh, we own a few businesses. Our, our main one is a real estate company, and I have some amazing agents, about 11 of them. And we also work out at the gym. I know you can't tell that, but her and I went to the gym and we're going back home. And she said, hey, we know, stop by really quick to the office. I got to send an email. So we pop in, we're all sweaty and in our gym clothes. And she gets to the machine and then a lady walks in. She's like, hi, my name is, let's just say Jody. And I'm here with the Washington State Auditors and we're going to audit you. And I'm like, oh, well, I'm not dressed. She's like, well, I don't care. And uh, so Amy starts, I'm like, I don't know. And then she comes in and she's like, I want to see your license. I want to see this and I want to see that. She came in just throwing blows. And I'm like, oh man. So she turns around, look at Amy. I'm like, start praying. <laughs> and then she's coming at me and she's like, I want to see this. I want to see that. And my stomach, you know, I'm, I'm just nervous. I'm like, I'm actually shaking. I'm like, oh my God, this lady's going to shut me down. And, and then she goes and sits down and Amy and I, Amy's crying. She's a wreck. And I'm like, Amy, just text people. So I pray for us and just start praying the tongues because I don't know what else to do. And she's like, I want to see all your paperwork for the last six months. And I'm like, okay. And at this time, I'm really like, all right, I'm a mess. You know, I'm crying. I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do. And she highlights 10 files. And uh, Juan actually stops by to say hi. And Amy's out there crying like, Juan, you can't be here. We're getting audited. And she's like, don't worry. We're going to pray for you. And she, we give her uh, 10 files, and she gets to her fifth one. And as we're praying, I just feel the Holy Spirit fall in, you know, in our office. And I just feel this peace, and, and that stomach ugliness goes away. And I walk over to Amy. I say, Amy, I feel peace. And she says, you know, so do I. I think we're going to be okay. And then I hear, Jesse, come back here. I'm like, oh, man. You know, so I'm sitting down. I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm cool at this time. And uh, she looks at me and says, please don't print no more files. She says, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm really thorough. And uh, in all my years doing a first time audit, I've never seen such immaculate, perfect paperwork. And uh, amen. And I said, oh, well, thank you so much. You know, uh, we strive for excellence. And she's like, well, no, I don't need to see the other files. And I want you guys to know that I've never seen this in a first time audit. I say, thank you so much. And so, but you had mentioned to me as we were talking about it that point, you're learning and there came a point where you just said, all right, Holy Spirit. Yeah. So this, uh, as a, if you come to the business momentum thing, what we want to teach is 
I've been telling Pastor Mike is every time something bad comes at you, especially if you own a business, you just freak out and it, everything's going to fall and, and, and you don't handle it, you forget about it. So I've been asking Holy Spirit, teach me when this happens, how to handle the situation. So when this happened, I told Amy, I says, no, we need to pray and we need to feel peace and let the Holy Spirit in it. So this is the third time something like this has happened and the Holy Spirit just comes and just hovers over our office and, and peace falls on top of it. So just really recognizing that. And that's, that's exactly what I, what I want to share with you guys today. That's what the Holy Spirit does. If, you, if you'll learn to just, to just default to Him and say, Holy Spirit, I'm jacked up right now. Fill me. Holy Spirit, I don't have the answer to this situation in my family. I don't, I don't know how to, how to minister to my kids. I don't know how to minister to my spouse. Holy Spirit, I, I don't know how I'm going to make it at work. The Holy Spirit inside of you becomes active, and he begins moving, and he begins speaking to you. And I just want to encourage you. Again, how, how do you develop that? It's just saying, Holy Spirit, fill me. Having, having a Holy Spirit awareness, say he's moving in your life. He's in you. If if you're here today and you've given your heart to Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. But that's not today's question. You have the Holy Spirit, but does the Holy Spirit have you? There's a difference. I have him, but does he have me? Does he have my affection? Does he have my attention? So you spend time, you read some scripture, and then you find out, okay, This world tells me I'm a mess. CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, ESPN, MTV, you name the station, they all tell me I'm a mess. Kids, my teachers at school, my friends at school, everybody tells me I'm a mess. Holy Spirit, what do you say about me? What are you saying about, okay, my doctor said I've got cancer. Holy Spirit, what are you saying about this? Holy Spirit, what are you saying? And you guys begin to develop that relationship. We, I'm still learning, but when you begin to develop that relationship, I'm telling you, you are empowered for a greater life. Is that a good word this morning? That's what I got for you.